I've never been to ENT Grand Rounds, so I'm very excited about this. <laughs> okay. Turn the light off. There you go. All right. Um, so this is purposely titled this. Uh, the balancing the patients of today and patients of tomorrow is something that's a little bit loud. Let's see if I can move it down a little bit lower. How's that? Better? Okay. Um, balancing the patients of today and patients of tomorrow. And I see that you guys do a little bit of what we do, which is a lot of behind the computers, behind the screen, steering it. Um, but when you guys are taking care of patients today, you're not taking care of just Mr. Jones, who's in the classroom, I mean, in the classroom, who's in the room, but you're also taking care of Mrs. Smith 10 years down the road. And so whether or not we are giving our residents autonomy is very important because if we're not, they're not going to be, a, they're not going to be advancing to the next spot. Now, autonomy does not let, mean that you let someone have free reign. And the stuff that I'm talking about today, you'll say, well, this is simple, this is, I do this for everybody. But my question for attendings in the room is, do you do this for everybody? Or do you do this when you have a good relationship with the resident you're working with? And you don't do it maybe when you don't have as good of a relationship with the resident. And so are people getting differential bits of their education? Are you training different physicians based, based on the relationship that you have during that time? So this is going to be very simple, and you're going to think this is very simple. And it is very simple, but it's just a reminder for us to try to do this with everyone that we do. So disclosures, uh, disclaimers, none. A big thank you uh, for being able to be here. A little bit of my background, I've always been enamored with education. Does anyone know who this is? This is Maria Montessori, and Maria Montessori was the first person with actual educational outcomes as far as I'm concerned because she took people in Italy, children specifically, and said, and people who had been, or individuals who had been labeled as, and the word was retarded at that time, and uh, in, the, were in the literature that I was reading, and she took them and had the standardized Italian exam, and they ended up outscoring those children in later years based on her educational framework. So the next person is Betty Calloway, this is my Montessori teacher, in a small town in Arkansas with a group of hippie liberals uh, in that small town um, who uh, felt that we needed a Montessori school and I grew up in that system uh, for a little while and I th she died just recently and so as I was putting together this talk I thought of her. First thing I did after college is I taught high school and this is the science department and you can see if you can locate me in that. I'm the upside down one on the left, that's May Mock on the right. Uh, everybody else in that science department had a, either a master's or a PhD, um, and we were at St. Andrew's School in Delaware, which is where Dead Poets Society was filmed, if you've ever seen that movie. Um, it's based on MBA, but filmed there. And then the other part of education, this is my family, uh, my husband Rick, and uh, my son, daughter, and my other son. And I bring this up because I did something for the first time a few weeks ago, or maybe it was about a few months ago, that I've never done before, and that was I solved a Rubik's Cube. And the way I did it was a brilliant lesson in autonomy from a teacher who I did not expect. And that was my 15-year-old son. And so he gave me the Rubik's Cube and he says, come on, Mom, you can do this. I said, I cannot do this. I have never been able to do this. I always have to. And he says, no. He says, I got the algorithm. So we sat there with an, he, he had the algorithm in his head, but he had the algorithm right there. Sat there and what he did is he coached me through that. And as I was doing it, I thought, this is brilliant, because I made a lot of wrong moves. And in the beginning, when I would start to make the wrong move, he would say, stop, that's the wrong move. And I'd say, okay. And he'd say, this one, this one, this one. And as we continued, by the end of working that Rubik's Cube, I was making the right moves, and he was not saying anything. And I thought to myself, this is taking someone through an appendectomy. This is when you're working with an intern, you're going through sort of show and tell. This is what you do. Here's how we're going to do it. You're, you take the move here, now I'm going to correct that very quickly because you don't know what you're doing. Now I'm going to correct a little bit more slowly. Now I'm going to let you play with it a little bit because by the end of that, you know, I was starting to make the wrong move and I'd say, wait a minute, that's the wrong move. And I'd move it back, but he just was silent during that time. And I thought that was brilliant. So to put yourself back in the learner phase and have someone take you through it teaches you that you need to do that. So we, we worked that successfully and that was the first and only time I've done that. Um, but I thought to myself, the next time I do it, am I going to be able to step up and solve it? Let's say I've done it at the end of it. It's the first time I've done it. Am I going to be able to step up and do the procedure the next time? No. Now, what's going to happen? Make fewer mistakes. I'm going to what? Make fewer mistakes. Make fewer mistakes, but I'm still going to make mistakes. So I'm still going to need that supervisor right there. If I want to work it completely, correctly, and safely, and efficiently, I'm still going to need the supervisor there. Fewer mistakes, fewer mistakes. Five times down the road, I should be able to do it. So if we're approaching each of our procedures that way, we are making progress. What are your barriers to giving these residents and some of these residents autonomy? Why wouldn't you? Just let them go at it. Yep. Well, um, mistakes in the operating room, you have sometimes 
serious consequences that are difficult to fix. All right, so the most important person is not the resident, right? That's why I say the residents too. You're not the most important person here. The most important person is the patient. So fear of complications. What else? Time. Time. You want to get home. Not only do you want to get home, you want to get to the next patient. Who else puts pressure on you for time besides yourself and whoever's waiting for you at home? Anesthesia, administration. Anesthesia, administration. We've got time. We've got pressure. So residents, we can't just have straight, can't just walk out and say, well, they didn't let me do anything. There might have been reasons. What else? What about fear of litigation? Okay, what about the patient who comes in and says, are you going to let the resident do my case? Or are you going to let them participate? Um, and I know that I'm going to go through these very quickly, but fear of complications, fear of litigation, fear of patient perception, pressure to get home, personality mismatch, pressure for productivity, individual compensation, hospital metrics. we got a lot of reasons not to teach in a teaching hospital. Um, but businesses have figured this out because businesses have invested in this and say that if we don't teach our unskilled workers very quickly and do it efficiently, we're not going to have people running the business. And our bottom line is revenue. So the quicker we do that, the better we are. And so this is what residency used to look like. And then you go into autonomous practice. Unfortunately, this is what residency looks like right now. And that's the difference between a smooth entry and a splash landing. But you still may be just as competent. You still may be able to swim, but it's going to be a little bit harder. So this is a grand round that I gave at OSU, and I skipped the whole think macro part. And we're just going to the think micro. Because the think macro is a little bit about workforce and patients and meeting expectations and why autonomy is important and that's a separate talk so we're just going to skip to think, think micro. So one concept is you always want to be working at your license plus one. So this is what residency looks like. Intern level, mid-level resident, practicing provider. Are there things that an intern can do? Yeah, what can an intern do? Come on you guys, what can an intern do? Suture sometimes, not always. I beg, I beg to differ. I've seen a lot who come in who can't. What can an intern do? What can they do? Direct laryngoscopies. Direct laryngoscopies. Probably not from the beginning, but probably after a few. Can they drape the patient? Can they help position the patient? I mean, some of these things you can't even do autonomously, right? You have to be taught. But there are things that you can do. And very quickly, if you've taught someone to do that, they can do it. But where you always want to be working, you can work there without supervision. So there are things you can do without supervision, but you always want to be working at your license plus one. Okay? In training, you always want to be working at your license plus one. As an attending, as a practicing physician, as an NP, as a PA, you always want to be working at your license. You don't want to be doing things you shouldn't be doing. And that plus one is with supervision. Another way to look at it is that this is the progression of practice, and this is what you, let me see if my pointer works on this. There, it gives me a mouse. Okay, so this is the amount of what you can do right here, okay, and this is what you want to be able to do by the time you're in attending, you're not going to get here just by sticking around, okay? You might actually get here if you're smart enough just by sticking around. And so that's saying, residence, this is on you too, because you're not going to just passively learn and get where you want to get. So how do you get to that next step? Well, this is the license plus one. During an individual procedure, you've got to be doing something in that procedure that you haven't done before. You've got to be pushing yourself. So that the next time you hit that, one month down the road, because if this is all residency and you're trying to get to the end and be at a competent physician, a surgeon, then you, you're going to be here down the road. And you don't want to be going back to try to learn this at that point. You want to be working on that. And then you want to be there. And you don't want to be there. You want to be up on the top. So you have to think about that with every individual procedure, every individual rotation that you're going in. What are you trying to get out of this that you haven't gotten the next time? You're not trying to just show up, see the patients, get home. Okay, that's a way to passively go through residency. So I challenge both the attending side and the residency side because you've got a hand in this. So tools in surgery, one thing that we're a part of, and you know, we, I will say as a caveat, we don't do this perfectly. There are things and barriers that we have too. The biggest barrier is convincing people that education is not just frou-frou. Okay? It's convincing people that this is something actually to listen to, to think about, to pay attention to. Um, but one thing that we're in is a quality co improvement collaborative for surgical education. It's called the PLC. It's Procedural Learning um, and Safety. And this is a group of institutions that started in 2004 with these three institutions. <coughs> okay? And the connection with these is all their surgical education groups. Gary Dunnington is the chair at uh, Indiana. Uh, very big in surgical education. And MGH and Northwestern is actually started by some residents who are now one is an attending at Michigan, and the other, I think, is still at MGH. Um, but now it's all of these institutions, and Nashville, Tennessee is on there, because I went and I heard a presentation from them, and I thought, this is actually where we need to be next. Um, this is what we need to be doing. 
And some of the, you who have been interns with us will grow and will you hear Simple, but I'm going to show you some of the data from Simple. And the biggest, what's my biggest barrier with Simple, for those of you who guys have spent time with me in my program? The biggest barrier is getting people to do it <laughs> and getting people to think about it and say, okay, this is important. Um, so Simple uses something called the Swish Scale. Simple is the app that the PLS, um, the Procedural Learning and Safety Collaborative, developed to assess how we are doing with surgical training. And it's the Swish Scale that's named after Barry Swishenberger, who's the chair at University of Kentucky, a very colorful man who brings his harmonica everywhere that he goes. Um, and the last time, well, I won't say that, but anyway. This is the scale that is a switch scale, which is basically when I'm working with you, I can tell you at the end of the procedure, it either was show and tell. I did it and told you what I was doing. It was active help, meaning I really let you participate, but I was directing you. There's no way you could do it on your own. It was passive help. You kind of knew what you were doing, but you needed some help, and I actively helped as assistant, whether you knew it or not. That's kind of what we talk about, moving the patient under the table while you do the procedure. Um, or it was supervision only, and that's truly where I stood up, watched you do it, um, and then you, you did it. And so you can grade them, and it's a very simple um, to say this is the way it was. Now, if you want to get complex, and we did this with our procurements here, and I'll show you a little bit of that that Heather Lillimo did, you can do that for every procedural step, too. You could say for the incision, it was supervision only. For the port placement, it was passive help. You know, it helped a little bit, but really they did it independently. Um, and so these are the things. So operative performance assessment, the recommendations that come from the studies from this is what I'm going to tell you guys because we only have 20 minutes. So what can you get from this? One, at the minimum, if you're saying that you did this procedure with a resident, at the minimum, you should record the procedure, the date, the performance, the level of autonomy, and also the patient-related complexity. Okay? Because if I'm doing an appendectomy and you are supervision only on this easy patient, it's not a bad thing if you are passive help on a patient that we were really considering converting to a right colectomy, but decided to go ahead and take out the, um, we're able to take out the appendix with some extra, extra help. And so those are things you want to have. Second, assessment should be completed immediately after observed performance. The worst thing these residents can hear is when they sit down with Dr. Sennard at their six month eval and they get a bomb dropped on them about how they performed on a particular rotation. Because it's six months, some, that means that it could be five months after they did it. You didn't give them a chance to improve, didn't give them performance, and it wasn't specific. And there's nothing worse than saying, this resident is inefficient. This resident, you know, has poor spatial um, understanding. This resident needs to work on their open skills. It's got to be specific, so, but it should be completed immediately after an observed performance. That means it can't come from Sonard, it's got to come from whoever you're working with at the time. Really, the recommendation by the literature is that all performances should be assessed, but this isn't practical, and we recognize that. So if not feasible, multiple raters should assess a large random number of samples, and we found that in the literature, 20. If you want to really know how someone's doing, 20. But you can say over residency, well, if they're doing really well with this procedure and really well with this procedure, they're probably doing well overall. So, and verbal, form, verbal formative feedback, verbative, I like that, should occur shortly after performance. Okay, so formative feedback, and we're going to talk about what formative feedback is and how you can get that. So this sounds simple. How many of us, myself included, do this? I try to do it, but, you know, I'm supposed to be the education person. I don't do it every time. Sometimes I've got to run. I've got to go do something. It's not that important to me at that time. It's not my priority level. So when it is, when you do have the opportunity to do this, make sure you're doing it. Um, and they found, I mean, this is scientifically studied with these, reduction of procedure time, movement, um, path length, smoothness, when you're getting feedback, you do better. It sounds kind of silly. I gave an entire talk once, which was, if you study, you will learn more. Because that just makes sense. We don't have to relearn that. This is stuff we don't have to relearn, we just have to be um, accurate with it. So this is what the app looks like. And so I was going to do an actual screenshot, but, I, but you can see that you just put in show and tell, active help, passive help, supervision only. And then you put the complexity of the patient. It takes about 20 seconds to put that in, and then however long I dictate. I dictate usually never more than a minute. And what do I dictate? And I'm sorry, this is actually what it will show me. So this is actual data from our program here at Vanderbilt. And you can see that in the PGY1 year, it's mostly show and tell, which is the orange. In the PGY5 year, most of the procedures are supervision only. And I would guess that those procedures, and I can look at the data this way too, passive help and active help are the more complex patients. So I can look and say, how am I doing as a program? I can pull up my individual data on my phone as a physician attending provider 
as to what level of autonomy I give residents. So I can actually pull it up and it's about one to one to one. Um, here's your performance levels. And so this is the second question. So first question is, what level of autonomy? Second level, what was the performance? Exceptional performance is the dark blue bar. Is that unusual that we're not giving exceptional performance for everyone? No, that's the way it should be. Because if they were having an exceptional performance on every procedure, they probably should be out practicing. So this is, this is appropriate. Um, and unfamiliar with the procedure. We want attendings to say this, and we want people to get immediate feedback. You were not familiar with that procedure. Come back. Let's try it again. How do you give feedback? Establish a smaller goal together. This is work from Heather Lulamo. If you can, at the beginning of a procedure, have an educational timeout where you say, what step of this operation do I want to work on? What autonomy level do I currently feel I am? And then what can I, what can I do to help improve that? If you have just that conversation with the attending beforehand, it improves uh, your performance. We showed that. So we had residents, and we, before we talked to them about this, how many people were doing this? And about a third were actually already doing this, and I'd say that those are your active learners. And afterwards, 80% were doing it, and the attendings agreed with that. And then when we said, did it help you identify your deficits? Overwhelmingly, yes. Did it increase your post-operative feedback that you got? Overwhelmingly, yes. And did it, um, was your educational experience stronger on this rotation because of this? Overwhelmingly, yes. That's it two-minute conversation before a procedure. Where are you? What are you trying to learn during this? And give immediate feedback. Give simple and structured feedback. To give simple instructions, it's three things. It needs to be observable. You can't say, you're not really good at this. It needs to be, you really struggled, we'll just say, you really struggled with you know, the exposure of the carotid here. Um, it needs to be correctable. Next time, you need to identify your landmarks more clearly earlier, and this is what you're going for. And it needs to be how to get to the next level. And that's included, so correctable and, and how to get to the next level. So the next time you come in, that's what you're focusing on. So establish a bill together, give immediate feedback, give simple structured feedback. And then this is my final slide, but I always remind myself of why this is important. So remember I told you I taught high school, and I got a book in the mail uh, from this young man once I got here and I was on staff, and it was his PhD dissertation. And this is one of my high school students who was an exchange student from Germany. Um, so he sent that to me. This young woman uh, was on my basketball team in my AP biology class, and she is a practicing general surgeon in Pennsylvania. I ran to her at a conference. And finally, this is probably most important to me, this is when I was in the hospital, and this is why your medical students matter too, I was in the hospital with my father at the VA in Little Rock, Arkansas. And this is the team that was taking care of him. And the chief resident, uh, the young woman who circled there, had been a visiting student at Vanderbilt on our service. And so whether you, you know, you can ignore people if you want to, but it may come back to bite you. Luckily, she had a good experience, and she took excellent care of my father during that. Um, so, so that, so hopefully, kind of in summary, you've got, there actually is some rhyming reason to this. There is science behind this. There are very simple things that you could think, do I do this? And I would just encourage you to do them more often if you're doing them, and to do it with some structure if you're not doing them. So I'll take any questions. Good morning, everybody, and thanks for having me. I told Dr. Wiggum it was not very fair that she had me follow a lifelong educator um, who is so natural up here, but I'll do my best this morning. All right, so I'm going to um, touch on some central sleep apnea, and I'm going to try to make it as relevant to um, you guys as possible. So just a little bit of an outline. Um, we're going to go through a case report, kind of talk about central versus obstructive apnea, kind of talk about some of the red flags in a sleep study report that should encourage you guys to refer to us. Go over what that physiologic central apnea that we always mention in the reports is. Uh, touch on control of breathing, pathophysiology, some of the causes of pathologic central apnea, uh, some of the workup that we do for central apnea, and then um, kind of your guys' role on effects of adenotonsillectomy on central apnea. First, I have a case here. So I have a 22-year-old healthy female. She presents with excessive daytime sleepiness and restless legs. Her restless legs is very severe and causing insomnia. She tried many medications for this in the past, including opiates. She had fatigue and drowsiness during the day with an Epworth sleepiness scale of uh, score of 14. Anything above 9 or 10 is abnormal, so she was pretty sleepy, dozing and very um, dozing very easily. She, would, uh, she reported that she occasionally wakes up with her heart pounding in the middle of the night. 
She does have morning headaches, frequent nightmares. And so at that initial visit, um, it was Dr. Walters who saw her, um, who kind of specializes in restless legs. He uh, went over management with her, checked her ferritin levels. Can you explain restless legs, please? It didn't exist till about 10 or 12 years ago. Yeah, so, and so what is restless legs? Yeah, so it's an urge to move your legs. So it's not, um, it's not necessarily pain. It is associated with certain things, um, like neuropathies, but not always. Uh, and it has four criteria. So it's an urge or a need to move your legs. Um, it happens on, only in the evening or at night, usually. Um, and then it happens more whenever you're laying down and you get at least temporary relief um, whenever you move your legs. So it's, those, it's a population of people who are laying there at night who just can't keep still. And it drives people crazy. Is it new? It's like autism hardly existed now. Every other child has autism, and restless legs didn't seem to exist, and now it's so common. So is it some new epidemic of something, or is it something that has always existed but didn't have a name? Yeah, I think it's always existed. It's just kind of been brought more to attention, and we now have diagnostic criteria. We now have better management for it, um, and so I think it's just more brought to people's attention. Yeah. And honestly, this is why she came to us. She, her legs were driving her crazy. She'd had it since she was two to three years old. There is a... Um, familial genetic component as well uh, and so she had a family uh, several family members with it and she actually has a two or three year old son who was already kind of kicking his legs a lot before going to sleep so genetic component as well um, and then Dr. Walters ordered an overnight sleep study mostly to look for periodic limb movements because if you have restless legs you have an increased risk of having periodic limb movements throughout the night and that can fragment sleep um, just better documentation um, to be able to um, get coverage for some of those or medications that, that can treat it. Better justify. Um, so this was her sleep study. Um, so let me just orient you a little bit. I'm not sure if this might be the best way. No. All right, so um, this is kind of the sleep stages here. This top bar is um, the wake stage. Um, the black is REM periods, and um, as it gets deeper, that's the deeper, that's more slow wave sleep, so in three sleep. Um, so she kind of cycles through appropriately, probably it doesn't hit quite as much REM as you would expect, um, but it's not, not overly fragmented um, as you would expect. Uh, these red lines here are kind of um, some hypopneas, so that's... Um, Basically what we're looking for in this uh, bottom part is apneas and hypopnea index. Apneas are a complete cessation of breathing uh, for 10 seconds, and then hypopneas are kind of shallower breathing. Hypopneas, we don't distinguish between central and obstructive. We just kind of list them. But apneas, we definitely distinguish between centrals and obstructive whenever we score. And all of these top lines up here are central apneas. You can see it's just completely solidly blue. Um, so the mixed apneas would be kind of in this bar right here, and then obstructive apneas would be lower. Clearly you can tell I would not be a good surgeon. My hand is shaking crazy. All right. Um, so she had pretty significant central sleep apnea. Her baseline apnea hypopnea index was 48.3, and her most of the hypopneas that Dr. Walters mentioned in the report that most of her hypopneas no, were, appeared to be central in nature, even though we didn't distinguish it on the report. The central apnea index was 45.4 events per hour. Very significant. And she didn't have a lot of periodic limb movements. So this is an example of somebody that you get completely unexpected results from a sleep study. Um, so this is as if you guys were to order this, if you guys were to have ordered this for uh, fragmented sleep and pauses in breathing and get this, this is kind of a no-brainer, not my problem, sending this on to sleep. Um, but one of the things that I'm going to touch on today is kind of what make those gray areas, um, what should be red flags and when you should refer. So this is this patient, and you can just see she just has those purple areas are um, central apneas. Those are the ones that we can mark on this page. There are several more that looked like central apneas, just didn't quite meet the um, length, the duration of 10 seconds. They were about nine seconds, so we couldn't count them. So she even had way more than um, were described. Um, but you can see in this apnea, so it's 
should be a little bit more flat than that, but usually um, apneas are pretty flat here. But you can see that her nasal pressure here is very flat. This is her airflow here. Um, and then you can see that these, the thoracic and abdomen, those are the effort belts or the effort channels. So there's, there are these belts that they wear at night, um, and we can see what their effort is. And she had complete flatness of those. So she wasn't even trying to breathe during those periods. And this is just another um, example from her study. Uh, whenever it turns green like that, that's kind of periodic breathing, meaning she just didn't even kind of catch up. She just had pauses, took a couple breaths, pauses, took a couple breaths. Um, and that just happened throughout the study. And so you can see those um, blue lines at the bottom. She's having some DSATs with it as well. So first thing Dr. Walters thought was, was she taking opiates on the night of that study? Um, did she have something that was decreasing her respiratory drive? Uh, she's taken opiates for her RLS before. Um, so that's one of the first things that he did. He called to make sure that she wasn't and she has not been taking opiates. So we went on to do um, an ASV titration and she was started on uh, nightly ASV. I'm gonna touch on what that is a little bit later and why we use that in, in patients with central apnea. Uh, it's a type of positive airway pressure uh, that's um, used overnight for central apnea purposes. And then we did a central apnea workup. What's causing this? Why is she having this? And um, I'll go over the central apnea workup in a little bit, but all of hers was normal except her brain MRI. She had a Chiari 1 malformation with the cerebellar tonsils extending eight millimeters below the frame and magnum. She also had a small uh, cervical syrinx as well. So she had, has since had a Chiari decompression surgery done. And unfortunately, I don't have follow-up results yet. Um, this is still kind of ongoing. Uh, but she does have an upcoming uh, sleep study to see if they've gotten better. So now a little bit about central versus obstructive apnea. All of you know very much about obstructive apnea and can probably explain it even better than myself. Um, we know that the obstructive apnea happens because there's uh, collapse or blockage in the airway uh, when the muscles are relaxed while we're sleeping. It causes loss of airflow uh, because of that narrowing. Central sleep apnea is whenever there's a lack of drive to breathe during sleep at all. So there's these periods of insufficient ventilation that lead to compromised gas exchange. Um, and that's kind of the difference. So you can see this picture at the top. Uh, there's obstructive apnea. There is effort in the respiratory effort. So that would be like the belts that they were wore, uh, that that patient wore. Um, so you can see that there's still effort in the obstructive apnea, but in the central apnea is completely flat for 10 seconds. Um, both the airflow and the respiratory effort. There is an overlap um, in the pathogenesis and pathophysiology of obstructive and central apnea. And it, oftentimes it can be hard for us to distinguish central from obstructive. And so the ideal way for us to be able to see that would be esophageal manometry, kind of be able to take a look at those pressures while they're sleeping. That's not really very feasible. It's kind of a little bit invasive. Um, we already throw so many channels on them <laughs> whenever they're sleeping as it is. Um, so the way that we kind of distinguish is through those effort channels. Uh, the symptoms for central and obstructive sleep apnea are very similar. Um, snoring is typically a little bit milder um, and a little bit more intermittent, but um, it, they definitely still can have snoring. Awakenings, these tend to have a little bit more um, waking feeling, dysnic, dysnic. Um, also feeling heart pounding, things like that. Um, morning headache you can have in both, but morning headache can sometimes be a little bit worse in central apnea. Uh, you have the same kind of uh, detrimental effects, long-term effects on cardiovascular health with central sleep apnea. So kind of here, here's a little bit about um, what you're looking at on a sleep study. So when we report out these sleep studies, especially in kids, uh, we tell you a total AHI, which is the apnea hypopnea index, as well as an obstructive AHI. Uh, you guys are mostly interested in the obstructive AHI, but um, if that central apnea index is, um, is high, then that might want, warrant you um, wanting to do further workup, or at least um, getting a post-op study uh, to reevaluate that central apnea index and then deciding if you want to refer from there. So central apnea index greater than five um, central apneas per hour, I would say that's a pretty significant red flag um, and something that you'd want to do a repeat study on those patients who get an adenotonsillectomy. Greater than one is actually considered abnormal, um, but there's been some data that um, kind of that one to five range most of them resolve um, post-op adenotonsillectomy, and I'll go over some of the, that data in a little bit. 
Uh, central sleep apnea is considered to be a primary diagnosis whenever greater than 50% of the apneas are scored as central. And so um, oftentimes in our, in our report, we'll re, re, we will report that the centrals, um, after elimination of physiologic central apneas, the obstructive AHI is this. Um, so we're basically stating that we took a look at those central apneas and they were physiologic, not necessarily concerning to us. But if we don't mention that, or we say that some of them were non-physiologic, some of them arose out of into in three sleep, uh, that might kind of <coughs> signal, you, signal you that you might want to um, take it a little bit more seriously. And then did they cause significant DSACs? Every once in a while we'll get this study that will have a central ap apnea, um, an oxygenator of 75%, and we'll write in parentheses isolated with one central apnea, but what is the significance of that? Um, and we've had follow-up studies. Honestly, we're not quite sure ourselves. We'll kind of look at those studies and be like, what do we do with this? Um, but it, it warrants follow-up because that's pretty significant uh, desaturations during the night. Um, and so often we'll repeat it. Um, if they have an obstructive component, we'll repeat it after um, post-op or after treatment. So what is a physiologic central apnea? Those that are in REM, so REM-related, those that are after a sigh, and those are after an arousal. Those are considered the physiologic ap central apneas. So this is an example um, of, you can see that line that says tone. There was a loud noise while somebody was sleeping. Somebody was in um, stable into sleep. There was this noise. Um, that bold line is um, kind of speeding up of the EEG, so they had an arousal during that period. You can see on the PET CO2 line, that it dropped, so the CO2 dropped. So when they woke up, and a little bit of, they awoke their uh, wakefulness drive for respiration, uh, they had hyperventilation, um, the CO2 went down, and that caused them to have a cessation and flow. So they had kind of a, an, a, um, a central apnea afterwards. So that's kind of an example of a physiologic post-arousal central apnea. Here are a few examples, worrisome or not. So this is um, a patient who's in stable N3 sleep, has a big arousal, um, has a couple of kind of central apneas, and then you can see that one that's, the first one's not marked because it's on awake, mostly on awake page, um, but that one that's circled, that's kind of after an arousal, and it caused another arousal. And then you can see how it kind of can cause this unstable uh, respiratory breathing there. This one is overall not worrisome. Um, it's post-arousal, it's physiologic. This, on the other hand, is worrisome. It's um, kind of almost like a chain Stokes pattern. Uh, you have the hyperventilation, the cessation of breathing, hyperventilation. Um, if that goes on for 40 seconds or longer, that would be considered chain Stokes. Um, and that's coming straight out of stable into sleep. There's not a big arousal following or preceding some of those events. This is straight out of N2, stable N2 sleep, but um, you can see that there's a big sigh right there, and so that's post sigh, and so that's physiologic, and that overall not worrisome. So we have these um, chemoreceptors, peripheral and central. Um, they kind of are some of the things that help us control our breathing in the middle of the night. The peripheral ones are located in the aortic and carotid bodies and are very sensitive to oxygen and carbon dioxide, and the centrals are distributed in the brain stem. And there are certain points in the night where we're expected to have unstable sleep. As we transition into sleep, um, it's notoriously, we're notoriously unstable. Um, our uh, respiratory drive goes down, um, our muscles relax, um, chemosensitivity decreases. There's a bunch of things that happen just into that transition to sleep. Um, everybody has a different apnea threshold, everybody has a different arous arousal threshold, so people are going to react differently um, to different events that happen in the night. This is just an example of when somebody, somebody's in stable into sleep and then they go into REM sleep, you can see this is right where REM starts and you can see the, the uh, breathing changes almost automatically. Um, REM, REM sleep uh, breathing is notoriously kind of just unstable, um, just looks very different. Um, so this is where REM kind of starts in the middle of this page, and 
that's when the, the breathing starts to get a little bit unstable. That's why the REM-related uh, central apneas aren't as significant, or they're more they're physiologic. This is kind of a big schematic, but let's just look at kind of the dark um, portions here. So um, you have decreased drive whenever you go to sleep. Um, that can lead to central apneas or hypopneas. Uh, whenever you have that, your CO2 levels go up. That causes you to breathe and want to breathe off the CO2. Uh, and then you get hypocapnia, which then decreases your drive, and it's kind of the circle, never-ending circle. There's a lot of different things that can affect that. There's a lot of different reasons, pathologic reasons, that can cause um, central sleep apnea. We have uh, heart failure causes chain stokes breathing. Uh, there's a lot of different medical disorders, other medical disorders that can cause central apneas. Um, high altitudes can cause periodic breathing. Narcotics uh, can cause central apnea. Lots of different reasons. Specific medical disorders that um, are significant for, that cause sleep apnea, uh, brainstem pathology, and uh, certain neuromuscular and neurologic disorders, as well as hypothyroidism is another one that's important to, to think of. So if we have a patient who has primary central apnea or has a really high <coughs> index, uh, we get an MRI with and without contrast um, to look for brainstem tumors as well as Chiari's. Uh, we get an echo to look for heart failure, a CMP to look for kidney failure, and then thyroid function tests to look for hypothyroid. Uh, opiates, significant cause of central apnea. We used to think that it would um, subside with longer term usage. Now there's more data that suggests that um, it's dose dependent and the longer you're on it, the more likely you are to get some central apnea. Uh, but this was interesting. Um, any kind of head and neck chemoradiation, which might be pertinent to you guys, um, can affect the um, ventilar ventilatory drive and can also cause some central apnea. Would that be because of the chemoreceptors? It is, and kind of just, uh, it depends on where the location is. Um, but yeah. Treatment emergent central sleep apnea. Um, this is more important kind of in our patients who have really bad sleep apnea and then we put them on a CPAP. Essentially, these patients are used to living at a really high CO2 level. Put them on a CPAP, um, that um, kind of clears up some of that dead space, blows off a lot of the CO2. Their CO2 is lower, brain thinks they don't need to, their respiratory drive decreases, um, and so they can have these central apneas. And you can see this patient, he had an initial AHI of 130. When he was put on CPAP right at the beginning of the night, he had centrals like crazy. Um, over time, his body kind of adjusted, um, and he got better throughout the night, but that doesn't always happen, and sometimes we need other modes of ventilation. I thought this was interesting for you guys as well. There is a correlation with laryngomalacia in central sleep apnea. Uh, there's a prevalence sh study that showed um, 54 patients with uh, laryngomalacia. Um, prevalence of central sleep apnea in this population was close to 50%. So something for you to think about if you're seeing these pediatric patients with laryngomalacia. Skip this. There's definitely um, a correlation between obesity and central sleep apnea. One thing that I thought was interesting here is that OSA isn't necessarily associated with abdominal obesity, but higher levels of abdominal obesity um, is uh, correlated with uh, with central sleep apnea, which is interesting. All right, and I think I'm out of time. I overestimated um, here. I'm just getting to the good stuff for you guys. Wrap up, uh, adenotonsillectomy um, does help central sleep apnea. Um, and that's just because a lot of the pathologies overlap, the pathophysiology overlaps, um, and um, treating them often will treat the, the central apnea. The, um, the time that it doesn't necessarily help is those patients with Down syndrome who have cardiac uh, history or hypothyroid. So if you have persistent central sleep apnea, you'd want to um, get further work up a river. Questions? Sorry.